So the title of the talk is the 12 Facts Wrap for Data, and my name's James Bokett. So uh, a little bit about me, I won't go on too much about this, um, some rather tragic lockdown here um, in this photo, uh, but I am the Technical Delivery Director for a company called Open Credo. We're a hands-on technical consultancy, and we deliver in a variety of areas, sort of cloud-native architectures, and platform engineering, and uh, data, data platforms. And the most kind of uh, the most relevant area that we deliver in is 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 data platforms for for this particular talk. And we've got a it's a sticker collection of of uh, different uh, companies and partners that we work with. Um, a little bit about me: I've spent uh, twenty something years in and around data centric applications. And, and what I mean by data centric applications is basically where you draw a tin can in the middle of a page, and then you have loads of things, loads of arrows pointing at it. Yeah. So. Now, what do we mean by a data-centric application? You know, what, what does that mean to you? There might be there's all sort of, there's been all sorts of different fads and flavors of, of data-centric applications over the years. You know, you maybe had a start off with a kind of a lambda architecture, or perhaps it's a kappa architecture where it's doing streaming and things like this, or perhaps you've got a medallion data structure with your bronze, silver, and gold, or perhaps you've got a, a data lake or a data lake house, or perhaps you've got a data mesh or a data fabric if you're one of the cool kids. You know, but all of these architectures and whatever, and you know, all of their different flavors in between, they all share one characteristic. They, they need to be, in the modern world, they need to be able to be deployed and developed very, very quickly. You know, users demand continuous delivery now, and that's what they expect. It's what they, it's what they should expect. But, so therefore, in order to do that, you need to be able to deploy quickly. And to be able to deploy quickly, you need to have a, a platform that is testable and well tested. And therefore, you need to be able to adapt to those systems in a safe and controlled manner. Now, this is regardless of if you're using SQL, NoSQL, schema full, schema less, anything like that. So these principles should apply to that. So there's a really nice quote by Steve McConnell. And he says, the problem with quick and dirty is that the dirty remains long after the quick is forgotten. Now, bear that in mind. Now, I also got another statistic off the internet, so it must be true. Um, that even if we don't realize it, the amount of data that we generate, so each internet user, so you're sitting there, you're probably checking your email or checking your Twitter or whatever it's called today. Um, each internet user is personally generating something like 1.7 megabytes of data per second. So that's if you're on Facebook, you know, you've got ads in there, you know, Google Maps, you got adverts, you're being pumped adverts, you email, WhatsApp, it's, it's all adverts derived data. Yeah? So if you think about that, and if you've ever looked at the cookie policies, when, when those cookie policies come up and say, oh, I'm going to send your data to these 700 organizations, they're all then doing stuff with it. They're aggregating it together. They're creating more data. So if you take those two statements together, quick and dirty, Everyone does a quick and dirty fix. You want to get a quick and dirty fix. But we're going to be dealing with terabytes of data, maybe petabytes of data. So then those small little problems or little quick and dirty fixes that you've done, they then multiply out massively when you're talking at petabytes scale of data. Now, this, uh, you know, this is a problem, you know, because not only to just fix those things, but maybe you've got to reload all that, data, all that data, you've got to unload it, you've got to do the fix, and then you've got to reload it again. And then actually you're talking about some kind of outage. So what I wanted to do was actually create a, a, a kind of a, a little kind of some rules of thumb. A lot of these should feel familiar to you. Um, a sequence of kind of things to kind of bear in mind when you're at the, you know, when it's the cheapest to actually change that data, not once you've got petabytes of data. So I, I borrowed some of the naming um, from the 12 Factor app, because if I think back to the 12 Factor app, I mean, it's what, about 10 years old, something like that, with those, um, uh, when those factors kind of first came out, uh, um, out of, uh, I think the guy was at Heroku at the time. So that helped me mold how we think about cloud-native and server-side development, uh, especially in terms of uh, observability and deployment. So I figured, why not have a similar set of guidelines for the world of data? You know, because data-heavy applications traditionally have not lent themselves to the newer world of continuous delivery. 
because they drag this great big database behind them, you know, kicking and screaming into the world of kind of um, doing a deployment. And so it's, oh, well, I've got, you know, I've got, you know, 10 terabytes of data. How am I going to regression test this? But there's ways and means around that. So um, one of those things is that we can actually look at that within the 12 factors as well. So, and some of the, uh, some of the, some of the recommendations that I make as well are to how to approach some of the socio-technical challenges with becoming a data-centric organization. So if you're a data engineer, if you've, if, if you've worked in data, then um, categorization theory is probably going to be really close to your heart. So um, I've got sort of four categories of, uh, of the factors. Now, it'd be really nice if, because I've got 12 and I've got four categories, I had three in each. But alas, I didn't, because so it's a little bit lumpy, and that really hurts my OCD. So uh, apologies if you get triggered by that. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll try and do my best to counsel you afterwards. But um, if we dig into the, the, the first category of changes that we've got, so architecture and design. So if we look at the first one, data structures as code. If you're using a structured data store, maybe you're using a SQL data store, don't rely on the UI to change your structure. Don't ever do that. Because if you do that, you've created, uh, you've created a snowflake environment. You've, you know, you've created its own unique environment. You've got to remember to make those changes to every environment as you roll those out. Also, you've got no traceability between the data structure changes and your application changes. You want to, those things are, are completely highly coupled. If you're pulling the data out, you need to make sure that that column or that document or that collection exists. Um, so there's, there's bunches of tools you can do for this. They, they, are, they are really easy to bolt onto even an existing data estate as well. There's things like Flyaway, Skitch, Liquibase. Um, you can even use Terraform for it. I mean, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the Terraform way of doing it. Terraform is brilliant at loads and loads of things. Um, but for SQL, not so much. Yeah. Um, but overall, but for the sake of your sanity and those of your fellow humans, the people on your team, the people that come after you, future you, don't make ch manual changes to that data structure. You know, make sure that you're able to roll those things out. Now, I also like to apply this to database configuration itself. So one of the things I really like to do is when you've got a, a, a data estate or you've got a, um, a new database platform that you've just um, uh, installed it from the floppy disks or whatever it is you, you do these days. Um, take the database configuration, download that straight away, and stick it straight in source control. So if I can give you a for instance, because if you've got it in source control, you know what each of your environments, what are the configurations that they are running. So if you're unlucky to be on support and you know it's the middle of the night on Sunday, no one else is around, rah, the database has gone down. Oh, okay, let me just check the isolation level. Oh, I don't have prod access. Okay, I need to wake Bob up. Bob, I need production access. Oh, I haven't, I haven't, got, the, I haven't got the elevated privileges to actually look at the database. Come on, oh, Bob, can you help me again? So every time you're phoning Bob, you're waking him up as well, but actually, what if all you needed to do was go into source control and you can actually look at those uh, running configuration changes, those, those little, those, those the running configuration parameters for your actually actual system. And you know that's what it is in prod because that's, what, that's how you rolled it out. It's the same all the way through. And you know that might be, that might, production might be running differently. It might have different retention periods or it might have different isolation levels or things like this, things that affect your application performance or your application behavior. So you want to know what those changes are between the environments. So when you're actually kind of promoting it, well, the way that we like to do this is uh, you create an ephemeral container. So something that actually runs, it's got your uh, configuration scripts, so your, your DDL changes, whatever it might be. You know, that, that Docker container boots up, migrates the data structure, it runs a script, it runs a tool, whatever it might be, logs the result, and then it dies. You know, this can apply to big data stores, not just relatable, uh, not just relational. So, but there's no excuses to do this. The tools are out there. It's pretty straightforward to do, and it only creates a mess if you don't, or it creates uncertainty, and none of us like uncertainty. Yeah. So, looking on to the second one, append-only data structures. So, 
I, I spent a large portion of my, uh, of my career actually working in finance, and we don't have the monopoly on append-only data structures, you know, we, we, but you do come across them a lot in finance because they really like history. Um, I worked at a hedge fund for a while, and, and the regulator wanted us to keep seven years of records. So all of our data needed to be online for seven years, which um, could be challenging in places. So what do I mean by append-only data structures? You know, you, there will always be a time where you need to update some data. You'll have job queue tables, or you'll have kind of different data on the inside where you're actually going to do a, an update to it. But if you adopt append-only data structures, and you're only ever appending to that data as much as you possibly can, you're going to leave a footprint. You're going to actually allow yourself to actually look back. What did I know at this time? Yeah. So if you've got that full history of your data, and it allows time travel through your data as well, which is useful for simulations and uh, avoiding overfitting. So as we know, the whole world is going to work on ChatGPT and machine learning and data science. It's, it's, we're all going to be out of a job before soon, before long. But the way to, <laughs> actually, the way to, to, to not be out of a job is to bake in some of the antithesis of some of these things as well. It's actually, that's job security. But really, what you want to do is, is, if you're training a model on what the data looks like today and you've overwritten that data as you've loaded it in, you're going to overfit that model. Because really what you want is you want to simulate what the model knew when the data was loaded at that time. So avoiding, uh, avoiding overfitting allows you to create much better models, much more accurate, much more useful models. Um, now, one thing that you're going to need to bear in mind with that is that the date that the data was loaded is not equal to the date that the thing happened. Maybe it's a business date or something like that. So this is how you're going to need to kind of um, keep track of multiple dates for a particular kind of row or document, whatever it might be. Yep. And this will make your later debugging a lot easier. If the data wasn't subsequently updated by something, you know, consider the example where you, where you have updated the data, or you've overwritten the data. Someone says, ah, oh, the thing's not working. Ah, OK, let me look at the data. Oh, well, it's working now. The, the data looks fine. But it wasn't working five minutes ago. Ah, so what happened? You don't know. You've got no footprints. You've got no way of knowing what happened at the time. What was the data that was in use at that time? What's updated it? Which process is updated? You know, it's like a whodunit on your data. So um, also, if you're going to restate that data, actually, if you're using an append-only data structure, you know that actually I've got new data, and you can tell what the delta is because you know what it was. And so you can actually restate that data later for downstream consumers. So basically, overall, what's going to happen is that future you will thank today you if you've got an append-only data structure. You can go back in time. So moving on, this next one is a little bit of a, a hobby horse of mine. So um, optimizing for access and for retrieval. The value from data is not from collecting it and digging a hole in the ground and sticking the data in it. The, the value from data is from reports, from display, from aggregations, from models, from actually doing something with it. Now, the thing is, you want to actually optimize how you're storing that data for how you want to get at that data. Because otherwise, you know, if you model the data in the way that it comes in, it's not always going to be the best for kind of easy or quick retrieval. Now, overall, you know, disk is mostly cheap. You know, sometimes it's cheap, sometimes it's expensive, but mostly it's cheap. You know, um, so you can denormalize that data. Bake the data in to what you know at that point, especially if you're following number two, append-only data structure. You want to know what you knew at that time. So actually pulling in the data or the data that it depends on it. You know, if you're in a relational model, then pull in the dimensions onto that fact table. You know, denormalize it onto there because actually that's going to help your time travel a little bit later, make it a little bit simpler. Another way to deal with that is that you might want to provide summary cubes, you know, cubes of data, you know, summarizations, aggregations across a particular day or a month or a week or something like that, some kind of behavior that you're measuring. Now, the problem with that, you do have a trade-off because any bugs in your upstream systems, if you've summarized those, you've baked them into your cubes, so you're going to need to restate those to your downstreams as well, which is all the world of being a kind of a, an ETL or an ELT developer <coughs> or running a data platform. So that is, the, that is the cross you have to bear, unfortunately. 
Now, some systems are optimized for writes, but you do need a plan to get at that data. You know, um, S3 is, is, a great, is the great dumping ground, you know. Ultimately, you can say, oh, yeah, well, I'm just, we're just, um, we've, got a Kafka, uh, we've got a Kafka cluster. We're going to sp spin it all out, spew it all out into S3. Great. Job done. Got my data back up. I'll run some analytics on it later, do some clever stuff. And you can put Athena over the top of it. But the thing is, you just need to be mindful of the schema of that data. You need to be mindful of the layout of those files. So you're still going to need to think about, how do I get that data back? Otherwise, all you've done is create a data graveyard rather than a data lake. Yeah. Um, so moving on, number four. So this is what I want to spend a little bit of time on, separating the data from the logic. This, this, uh, sorry, this is one that actually get, really gets me to my complete core. Leaky abstractions. You can create leaky abstractions really nicely and easily if you don't pay attention to this. You, know, you want to be kind to others maintaining the data. It might be you, even, maintaining that data. So I've got a kind of couple of, uh, kind of counter examples from uh, different systems I've worked on. Um, where the other users hated me. Um, so 1753 and, and uh, you know, the end of uh, almost the year 10,000, now those are special values. Those are special values within SQL Server 2005 or something. So embedding special values in your data is a leaky abstraction. If you've got these values in your database, everywhere you access that data, you need to think about what am I doing with that data? Or what does this data mean? What does that date mean, for instance? Yeah, you know, and you've got to know: is that a bona fide end date, or is it a special value? Now, this leaks into everywhere you use it. You know, um, I think in one of the systems that I worked on, actually, unfortunately, the um, the quant at the time had said, "Well, end dates on records that are uh, live are the current records. Uh, we'll put their end date to 1753." I was like, "Right, that's a bad idea." Um, because now I can't even use Boolean logic to say, actually, if it's greater than today, then it's a current, system, then it's a current record. Yeah, I have to actually have a knowledge of the fact that that 1753 date is, uh, you know, is not going to order my records properly. Yeah. So there we have it. Yeah. So this is where end date is null, which is what some sane, any sane person would put in. Um, but our end date is thir December 31st, 9999. You know, this is a problem. It's a leaky abstraction. Everywhere I access this, I have to put this, this, uh, this code in. If I just made the design decision to have end date as null, that makes sense, and I can do that everywhere else. Yeah, but now I've got an extra line of SQL that I didn't need before. Yeah? But remember, if we're dealing with petabytes of data, yeah, and if we've got large code bases and lots of different pieces of code access this, we're going to need to be mindful of that line. That's an extra line to, 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 to maintain and feed and water. Yeah? Another example, um, what if columns change their meaning based on the value of other columns as well? This is a nice one. So uh, in, I've got a sort of table of, uh, table of contracts there. Um, cancellation reason is a breach, um, which means the end date is a breach date. Um, but I've also got this matured column as well. So actually, if it's matured is true, then the end date is actually a maturity date. So if I want to look at all the all the breaches, I just do well cancellation region equals breach. But what about this row? This says it's matured, and there was a breach. So is that is that a cancellation date? Is it a maturity date? Is it? Um, so what is it? I don't really know just by looking at the data. And and what's worse about this is that what will happen is I've got to go and look at some documentation. It's not immediately obvious to me. Or even worse, I might have to go and speak to someone. You know, we don't like speaking to people. That's just not. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, I'm making a serious point there. I mean, I'm being um, being facetious about not wanting to speak to people. But as soon as you interrupt somebody else, you're interrupting their flow and you're ruining their day. Yeah. If you can self-serve, if you can look after yourself with this data, then you're going to be a much happier bunny because you can deliver a lot quite faster than everybody. Uh, you know, than if you didn't have to do that. Another example as well. What if some columns are populated only if there's a magic value in one of the other tables? So um, as I say, I, I'm, I'm recovering from a life in finance and capital markets. Um, so this is a, a, a table of trades. Somebody wants a table of trades. That is completely, that is a, a, a very noble and, and righteous thing to want to do. But the trouble is trades and underlying um, instruments within the trading system 
they, will, they work in different ways. So options get their price from an underlier or get their value from an underlier, whereas equities, that's just a, a normal trade, a share that you can uh, deal on the Copenhagen exchange. So if I've got a table that I'm housing both of those different flavors of data into it, is actually for an option, the underlier column will be populated. But for an equity, the underlier price will not be populated. So I've got these sort of sparse columns. And this might actually get worse and worse as I kind of add more columns. Or maybe if I add another instrument type, I might need to add an another few more, uh, a few more columns. Like what if I do weather options as well? I'm going to need, you know, what's the weather forecast? What's the, is, you know, is it hurricane season? And then my table is getting fatter and fatter and fatter. But actually, it's becoming less and less relevant to all of the rows of the data. You know, what happens if the, the magic values in instrument type changes? What if we, as I say, what if we start doing weather options? Everywhere that I pull that data out and I, I cope with those different, the sparseness of the columns, I'm going to actually need to actually change that logic as well. So um, all of this as well, within a relational database store, within a relational database system, this will actually play havoc with the way that a database performs. So if you're not aware, so a database, a relational database, will divide its, its table spaces into pages, and that, those pages will store multiple rows of data within that. And so the database then samples the tables and sort of computes statistics and sort of says, oh, well, roughly when, it's, when we're looking at options, um, I'm going to choose 10% of the rows, whatever it might be. And so it knows, it calculates then how much I.O. it's going to need to do against those pages within on the actual disk. But actually, with sparse rows, those pages might not be properly packed in. So it might get more data, it might be doing more I.O. and actually doing more work than it actually needs to because of the way that the database engineer has actually set that out rather than how it's physically laid out on disk. So you're actually going to start hindering the performance of a particular DBMS as well. Um, am I moving on from there? Ah, OK. Um, strongly type your data fields. I, I, I'm a big fan of types. I spent a couple of years as a Ruby programmer, and I, I don't particularly want to go back to the world of duck typing. I really like types. They really, really help. Yeah, but if you're being strict with the kinds of data that you allow into your DBMS or your, your data store, it means that actually it allows you to maintain that data quality. And that applies to kind of NoSQL as well as, um, so, you know, either NoSQL stores or schemaless stores, yeah? Um, so, you know, so what if you store a, a number in a varchar or a string column? Who cares, yeah? The problem is the sorting will be based on the collation of that particular table. It's another leaky abstraction. You know, you're going to have to, um, what have I got here? I've got, uh, I have got an example of this as well, actually. So if I show you an example of what I mean by this. So consider I've got a users table here. I've got a user ID. It's of type string, and it's a uh, five. So I've got this kind of users document here. Now maybe I've got um, a bunch of different processes that are going to look at that table. Yeah, maybe I've got a microservices estate, and I've got three different languages and things like that. Um, now the problem is, can you read that OK? Oh, yeah, it's nice and big. Um, that integer.parseInt in the Java or the, the, the int, the type coercion, that doesn't need to be there. That is just technical debt. just waiting to happen. So the, that design choice or the lack of design choice has leaked into all these different code bases. Now, the same will, will actually be the case when, actually, if you want to join on that table as well, and in another table that the user ID is actually um, of the correct type. It's actually of, of, of type integer. You're actually going to need to coerce that type as well. So the index strategy won't work. When you do a merge sort join, it's not going to actually, it's not actually going to work with that table. It's going to make the database do far more work than it needs to. And for what? You've not really gained anything. It's just carelessness. Yeah? Again, if you're you're at petabyte scale, petabyte scale, these things matter. Because then when you're kind of if you're going to um, uh, migrate that data, that's going to be a very long-running job that's going to take you a long while. And you might actually have your, your data not accessible during that time. Um, hmm. So quality and validation. <coughs> 
So, so architect for regression testability. So, continuous delivery. Everyone loves a bit of continuous delivery. You know, you really want to be um, pushing your features all the way into production. Absolutely, every time. But data's getting bigger all the time, like we said. Now, regression testing, that's a prerequisite for CD. You can't deliver something into production unless you know it's going to work, unless you've tried it and tested it on other environments. You've got a, maybe you've got a post-deployment check, something like this, yeah? Now, there's ways in which you can make a data architecture friendly to regression testing. You know, I've worked on, on systems, uh, risk systems, that maybe they release only four times, three, four times a year because they have a three-month testing cycle, and maybe they, they actually have those. <laughs> You're nodding. Um, but basically, it's like, no, don't touch it. You know, we've got to test the whole thing, and it's terabytes of data, and, it's, and that's difficult. Because, but the thing is, you've got to get your stakeholders happy with doing incremental changes and their smaller testing cycles. So let's look at a, a little example. So we've got some data files that we're loading into prod, and we've got a prod system, we've got a UAT system. Yeah. Um, so quite often, most people will perform some kind of database backup on prod and load it into UAT. So, hey, DBAs, can I get a prod backup? Yeah, I've got one from a week ago. Uh, it's not ideal, but I'll have it. So I'll kick everybody off UAT, load it up. Maybe it's ready in the next sort of day, couple of days or something like that. Oh, you know, a lot of these things are actually kind of self-servicing, self-service, uh, you know, self-service tools over the top of it. So that's okay. But it's still, it's still not great. It's still not in lockstep. Yeah. Now, what if we were able to just listen in to that prod data? So, sorry, that's my picture of a backup happening into UAT. So, um, so just reset a second. So consider using an immutable stream to carry the inputs. Yeah, something like Kafka, Flink, Red Panda, Pulsar, something like this. So an immutable stream, you know, you know that's not going to change because that's what those systems tell you. That's their, that's their value prop, yeah? So, I know that this data isn't going to change, and I can do my uh, loading into prod. But then what I can also do is that I can listen in to that from UAT. So I can load that in parallel. And I don't have to have the same amount of data um, retained in UAT. But what we can do, we can do some really nice things, like um, we can then do a, um, a canary deployment maybe into just into UAT, and I can compare what happened when uh, today's data was loaded in my prod version versus my UAT version. Or you can do like-for-like -like comparisons, which is actually super, super useful, because then you can say, well, actually, I'll just make a little change. And actually, here's something that has, uh, this is my expected result. And so I'll promote that release. Great. Um, the other thing you can do here, actually, uh, I have a, another conference talk on this from, from a while ago, is that you could actually, instead of doing UAT and prod, if you really want to, if you get your stakeholders used to it, you can actually do blue-green into prod. Now, the problem of doing blue-green into prod, it does become a little bit more complicated. Perhaps you've got a really big data estate or something like this, that actually having a full UAT system is too expensive. But if you do blue-green straight into prod, if you've got lots and lots of processes that work on your data, all of those processes need to be kind of blue-green aware. You know, so um, they need to know, do they... They, they will see multiple versions of the same piece of input data on a particular business day or whatever period it might be. And they also, those processes need to understand whether they should look at the blue version or they should look at the green version. So it does make things a little bit more complex, but the value that you're going to be able to get from that is you can do a direct comparison within your prod environment as long as your applications kind of um, uh, can cater for that. Um, moving on. Um, track changes in your test data. So this is a little bit orthogonal to the actual design of your actual data system. But if you've been a data engineer for any sort of length of time, you know what happens is that actually, uh, okay, I'm, I'm writing an ETL pipeline, maybe I'm doing some DBT or something like this. Um, so basically the upstream system will give you a, an example data file. You say, awesome, data file, thank you very much. Right, I've got some tests to write. So I hope you're writing tests. You better be writing tests. Um, so, okay, so I will bake some values into this test file. You know, maybe I've got some boundary conditions. Maybe I'm going to put some nulls in there, just some stuff that will trip up my, my data pipeline, and I want to make sure that actually I can cope with that. It's a noble aim. Crack on. 
Now, but the problem is, what often happens is that maybe the upstream system will get you a new data file. Says, oh, yeah, sorry, that data file was bilge. Here's a new one. It's formatted different. I've stuck a new column right in the middle. It's a CSV file. You're going to need to deal with that. So, oh, great, OK. Oh, I've got the data file. Ah, oh, I've made a load of changes to the data file. I don't know what those changes that I've made to that data file, I don't know why I've made those changes, and I've got no baseline against it. So at its, um, at, its, at, its, at its most basic level, once you get that data file, check it into source control. And if it's too big, don't, you know, just at least take a baseline. Maybe you stick it on S3, but you stick it with a catalog or something like that. Or maybe what you're going to do, because what you want to do is, as you develop features and you change the underlying uh, data file within for your unit test, you want to know why you've done those changes, and you want to use those as an atomic unit that you're actually going to then um, effectively promote as you're doing more feature development. So if you keep that log, when you get a new uh, version of the test data, you can just apply those changes into that new version of the test data. Or alternatively, you can... Um, uh, oh, no, I've lost my thread. Sorry. <laughs> um, or alternatively, what you can do, actually, is if you don't want to do that and the test data is too big, what you could do is maybe just write a, a little tool and uh, keep your uh, deltas stored in source control. And that actually, what you do as a, some preprocessor step before you run your unit tests is actually you apply those delta changes into some baseline data file ready for your um, test to happen. So moving on a little bit more, so we've got an, an, another section. So audit and explainability. So we've got a couple in here. Um, data cataloging. Um, if you've got no data catalog at all, then a spreadsheet is OK. But ultimately, spreadsheets don't cut it these days. There's so many more tools out there. Um, Amundsen, Atlas, Open Metadata. I, I was looking at Open Metadata the other day. I was quite impressed with it, actually, because a lot of the tooling out there does not support branches or labels and release tags. So the, the catalog's metadata, um, what you want is that the as part of a release, you want to make any schema changes, database changes, infrastructure changes, feature changes, um, secrets, and anything changes to the metadata. That's five or six things. They all want to go out, and they all need to be promoted as an atomic unit. And so they all need to be in source control, or they all need to be completely coupled together, because they are coupled together. So treat them together, because you don't want to not forget, or you don't want to forget to release one of those components on release night, or release, well, hopefully you're doing multiple releases a day, but at release time, put it that way. Um, and as I say, a lot of those tools do not support uh, branching and uh, naming of releases and things like that. Um, so if they don't, you're going to need a, a prod instance, a UAT instance, and a dev instance as well. Um, but the ultimately, you want to actually know that you can promote between these environments. So that metadata needs to be kept in sync, as I say, because it is coupled to the both the data structure and to the application code. And it avoids drifts and bugs due to inconsistencies, because that is a horrible place to be. Now, the tooling will actually help you do like nice kind of metadata programming and things like that, which is, which is all really useful. Um, for additional points, you want to track the lineage in your data as well. So you're going to need that for auditing and compliance. And that's much more complex than data source A goes to data source B. It might actually be at the field level. Or actually, even worse, it could be at the field and the row level as well. So because data lineage is not static over time, just because you've loaded that data today doesn't mean that, oh, you know, another, another source system might come online and say, actually, our data birth field is much more reliable, so actually now you need to get, get it from us instead of um, uh, source A. So it's about, you know, that will likely change with feature changes as your code base evolves over time as well. So you want to kind of keep track of that. Now, speaking of which, you really want to track, you know, data, data's more often than not, is derived from other data or it's generated by software, or it's generated by code, or it's, it's, it's ETL'd by code, or ELT'd by code. Now, a lot of people are not great at this. So you really need to basically tag the data, or have some way, some traceability between the data that ends up in your database, whatever your data store, 
where that's come from, who's done it, what's the lineage, what's the, what's the binary piece of code, you know, what's the, what's the label of that? You know, there might be regulatory reasons for having to do that. You know, they might knock on your door and say, hey, look, why does this number look like this? What, what have you done? What gave rise to this number? You might have explainability in models. Now, this, this is actually, um, I believe it came, became in law, actually. So you might have to explain why is your model racist or sexist or whatever, whatever kind of ism that that model might have. You're going to need to explain that. Now, if you can't tie what's in your tables or what's in your data to what code generated it, you're going to have a really hard time convincing somebody that you fixed the, the, the whatever problem you have within that model that's giving rise to some prejudicial behavior. Um, other reasons are things like audit, fixing bugs from upstream systems. You know, um, is the code that's in source control, is that going to deal with a problem that I've got from an upstream system? Or even actually covering your ass with the downstream systems as well, actually saying, oh, no, this, this bug doesn't apply to us because, look, here it's working in a, uh, a unit test. And also being able to roll forward and roll backwards as well. If you know the version of the data that created something, you know whether that bug, you can then identify whether that bug is actually in operation on those particular rows and maybe just fix the subset of rows that are affected by that data being able to roll forward or roll back. Yeah, rather than just saying, oh, God, I don't know which rows they are, so I'll just have to rerun the entire batch job, stream job, or the entire table. I have to just reload the whole table. So the code in prod now, so bear in mind, the code in prod now won't always be the code that generated the most recent data for any particular entity. Yeah. Uh, how long have I got? Oh, 36 minutes. Okay. Um, so consumption. So... As I said right at the start, is that there's no use just collecting all, these, all this data. There's absolutely no, no use for it at all. You know, if you can't get at it, it's all you've got is just data in a lake or a swamp or a hole in the ground. You might as well. It's, not, it's, it's, about, what <laughs> it's about what you do with it. Um, so, defined API, so define some APIs for accessing the data. Yeah? Make the domain clear to the reader. Because again, you as the database engineer, if you're not making that clear to the outside world when they use it, you're going to have people coming to ask you stuff. And you don't want to have people asking stuff because you've got stuff you've got to deliver. You've got, you've got stakeholders that you need to keep happy. Yeah? Keep data on the inside separate from data on the outside. Data that you're going to give to other people, that you're going to serve up to other people. That's very different from a job queue table or, or the table that keeps track of which code loaded that data, yeah? And have policies for both, you know, retention periods. You, you'll need to treat certain things differently. You know, stuff, data that you're serving up, you might need that on solid state storage or something like that. You want to keep that different. You want to keep that as a, as a different bucket to the data that you're just kind of maybe just, you know, keeping track of some stuff internally, yeah? Now, the, the next point that I have to make is that um, is really important. So. Don't allow external systems directly into your data store. Just don't do it. Yeah, if you do, congratulations, you're married. Yeah, that's how this goes. And marriage is a fine institution between two consenting adults. My wife tells me that it is a fine institution. Um, but between two databases, it is absolute hell. Because if you do get married, if you, t if you marry your database system to some other service from some other team, you think you're doing them a favor, but actually you're doing your entire own team an absolute disservice because you can create unnecessary and unpredictable load on your system. Some joker in that other team is just writing a select star or, or um, going to get all of your all of your documents. Yeah, you've got a risk of deadlock. Yeah, someone's reading your data while you're trying to write to it. It's a, it's an OLTP table. Who cares? You know, um, uh, you don't know the semantics of how that table is being used um, anymore. It's difficult to audit. It's difficult to secure. You know, you don't know what those people are coming in and doing. You don't know what they're doing with that data. You know, you don't know what you've given them a license to do. And also, it's difficult to evolve your own database and do releases on your database because they might have... It's like, oh, well, no, you can't take that database down because we're doing something mission critical. It's like, well, this is my database. You shouldn't have your fingers in it, you know? Um, 
but ultimately your SLA guarantees are going to be affected by that coupled system. So you can't make, you can't go and say hand on heart that you can deliver this stuff because somebody else is causing load on your system. Um, in a sort of similar way as well, is actually talking of SLAs and, uh, you know, uh, and service level objectives as well. Keep yourself honest. Create SLAs for accuracy and quality. The referential integrity, you know, how, how good is your data? How, what is the quality? How is it going to reference itself or reference each other? Yeah? The timeliness, how quickly are you going to get that data to people? You know, is that, is that okay for the people consuming your data? If it's not, then perhaps they need to stump up some cash and actually give you some more resources, and, uh, you know, cloud resources or people or whatever it might be. Um, if you ever need to restate data, if you have um, some problems in your upstream system, what's going to be uh, what's going to be okay? What's going to be acceptable to the people that's reading your data? If you've got SLAs and you're coupled with APIs as well, you've got a a point at which you can have that conversation. You can actually center that conversation around that. Yeah. You know what documentation will we provide? How will you keep it up to date? How will you guarantee that you've kept it up to date as well? So basically, keep yourself honest on this. And the last one is something that I, I borrowed from the cool kids over at the Data Mesh crowd. Um, product thinking. Now, product thinking is kind of, um, it's all the rage in all, all sorts of different walks of, of software development. But I think that actually it's really important for data as well. So it means your consumers, if you're starting to think of your data as a product, then your consumers are going to get a decent level of service and quality, you know, they're going to they're gonna raise that bar you're, or you're going to raise that bar because you're having that, you're surfacing that conversation. You're saying, how quickly do you need that data? How accurate do you need it to be? What would be the impact if I actually need to restate this? Do you need me to restate as a delta? Do you need me to restate as a, as a full uh, database extract? Yeah. So the more your data is used by others, the more it can be relied upon. So the more it can be relied upon, the more they can create derived data. You know, that 1.7 megabytes a second, yeah, that other derived data that you can get much better adverts. You know, I think we'd all be grateful for that. But the more that derived data can be relied upon is that that's the path to becoming really a data-driven organization. Um, and that is phase three equals profit, isn't it? Um, so to recap, so in summary, we've got uh, five tenets in architecture and design. So data structures as code. I mean, in fact, we could say, not just data structures code, everything is code. You know, secrets, infrastructure, data structures, code as code, you know, everything as code. Yeah, treat everything as code and, and, and deploy it as an artifact, as an artifact, because they're coupled together, keep them together. Append only data structures. That's going to help you to reason about your system as to what's going on. Yeah, deadlocks are caused by, as we were talking about, deadlocks are caused by databases being updated while they're being read. Yeah, lock escalation and, and all sorts of nastiness. Um, don't just dig a hole in the ground and put your data into it. Optimize for access and retrieval because there's no use. Uh, it's no use working the data if you can't get at it. Separate the data from the logic. Don't have leaky abstractions. Don't allow those abstractions or that laziness to actually leak out into other systems and put the onus on the people reading that data to actually cope with it. Um, and uh, finally, in architecture and design, strongly type your data columns. So it's a little bit like str strongly typing your data in general, is that actually you kind of want to make that data kind of um, uh, almost like immutable and uh, you know, self-describing in, in lots of ways as best you can. Quality and validation, you know, architects, put some things in the place so that you can actually regression test it, because that will open the door to continuous delivery. You know, track changes in your test data. Do yourself a favor. Yeah? Allow yourself a, a fighting chance for, for later versions of your software to, to be upgraded really nicely because this is another way of, upgrade, of um, opening the door to, um, uh, to CD. Um, metadata. Data cataloging. You've got, to, you've got to do data cataloging. If you're not doing anything, you've got to do something. And if you're doing spreadsheets, consider using a tool because that's going to help you to do something that uh, it's going to allow you to create things like data contracts, which will actually allow you to encapsulate what those data changes are and then have another promotable artifact between the, uh, between the environments that's traceable back to the JIRA ticket or, or whatever it might be, or the Azure DevOps uh, entry. Yeah? Code traceability, trace between 
the code that is running the ELT pipeline or the ETL pipeline, um, and being able to trace that with the, with the data that it generates. Um, and finally, consumption. If you're treating data as a product, you're going to want APIs, and you're going to want SLAs and SLOs to keep yourself honest. And so, actually, if you start to think about all of these little things, and think about these things when you're kind of starting out, rather than once you've got petabytes of data, is that actually you're going to make your life a lot, lot easier, and you're not going to um, fall foul of the, uh, of the quick and dirty once the, the quick is forgotten. OK? That's everything I have. So um, if we've got any questions, or um, um, if not, then, um, then thanks. <laughs>